I'm going to resume with Machiavelli's The Prince, a full analysis resuming from chapter 4, which is where we left off. In chapter 4, Machiavelli describes two modes of governing. Mode number one is in which a prince governs with servants who are acting as ministers. Mode number two is in which a prince governs with barons. And the barons have their power from heritage, not power that was given to them by the prince. Mode of government number one is hard to conquer, easy to hold. And the reason that it's hard to conquer is because being that the prince gave power to the servants, that is the ministers who are acting on his behalf to govern, they know that as a minister, they're merely a servant and their power comes from the prince. So they're going to do everything to keep the prince in power because their power comes from him. And if he gets overthrown, they get overthrown. So it is indeed a unified principality. That's why that kind of principality is hard to conquer. However, if you do conquer it, it's easy to hold. What I mean by that is if you were to go in and conquer a principality in which the prince governed with ministers whom he appointed, then once you take them down and murder that prince and all of his family, then it's smooth sailing because there is a power vacuum that you can step into. There are no other powerful entities, no other powerful aristocrats who can take you down. There are very little folks left to create rebellion, so it's hard to conquer because it's unified, but once you take it down, it's easy to hold. Now, how does that apply to your life? When you are in a position of leadership within an organization and you have other people who work with you or work for you, your subordinates, you might be the boss and then you have supervisors under you and the supervisors manage lower level people below them. As long as you are the one who truly controls the employment of these supervisors, you're their direct boss, you control the hiring and firing of these supervisors, they will be loyal to you because they know that their ability to have a job is directly connected to you. So anytime you're the leader within an organization, it's very important that you're the true leader, meaning that everyone's power comes from you and they know that they cannot go above you. So you have to constantly reiterate and reinforce that, hey, if you guys want to stay in power, you want to thrive, I need to stay in power, I need to thrive. That's mode of government number one. Very hard for outside forces to conquer because it's unified, but it's very easy for outside forces to hold it once they conquer it. Principality, excuse me, governing mode number two. That's in which a prince is governing with barons. And these barons have their power, not from the prince, but they have their power because they got it through heredity. Their family had been ruling in that land for quite some time. That's where they got their power from. This type of principality, or excuse me, this mode of government is easy to conquer. It is hard to hold. Why is it easy to conquer? Because if I'm an outsider and I would like to conquer your principality. I just have to go to one of those barons and win that baron over to my side. And if I can win over multiple barons to my side, it's easy for me to conquer the prince because I have people within the, within the kingdom that are going to ride with me, right? People who will flip on the prince. However, it's hard to hold because as long as there are these aristocrats, these powerful barons, these merchants, or these well-to-do major families, as long as they're all there and they have their own little power bases, me as a new prince, I always have to worry about these folks turning on me the same way they turned on the last prince. So that's an important thing to know. Now, if you want a historical example, if you've heard of Dracula, you know, the guy with the vamp vampire teeth? That's actually based on uh, Vlad Dracula, which is a real king who was in Wallachia. And there was a time that he invited all of the barons and aristocrats to have dinner, and then he murdered them because he wanted to be the sole ruler, and he knew that these are the very people who can take him out of power. So he got rid of them. Now that was chapter four. That's pretty much all you need to know. Moving on to chapter five, this is about governing formerly free people. This means you're a prince and you're governing people who, before you showed up, were in a republic of some sort, meaning that they had some level of power, maybe self-government, maybe the ability to vote. They're not used to being ruled by a monarch. 
by a prince. The question is, how can you hold those people? How can you control that territory? There are three major ways that Machiavelli describes. Number one is to completely crush and devastate the people using force. Number two is to live in the new state, meaning you have to live among the people in this new territory. And number three, you allow them to maintain their laws, you draw a tribute, and you establish an oligarchy. To give you an interpretation of what that means, that third method, you let, you let them maintain their laws so you don't change anything on the, the legal side. You draw a tribute, meaning you take money, you have them like send money to your kingdom in the form of taxes, right? And then you establish an oligarchy, meaning you have local folks there, maybe barons, maybe wealthy families or popular leaders within their territory, and you put those folks in charge and they run that land based on, uh, excuse me, they run that land on your behalf. Machiavelli says of these three ways, and he says, always having liberty as a watchword, the only way to govern formerly free people is to crush them totally. Time and gifts will not bring them to your favor. He says that on page 38 which is to say if people have been previously free, they will never forget about that. You can never reduce a person's level of living down. It's very hard to do. You can increase freedom, but you can never decrease freedom. So if people are used to being free, they will always think of liberty. No matter how many favors you give them, if you give them gifts, they will never accept the idea of being under a prince or a king once they are used to having the vote or living in a republic. I want you to think about that in your own personal affairs because whether you're dealing with your children or your wife, what have you, in the case of children, if you have your kids and you tell them, okay, I'm gonna let you uh, stay out till 1 a.m., you can never roll it back and say, you know what, this world is too dangerous. You can only stay out to 11 p.m. So remember and be mindful to give Liberty by inches because once you give that liberty, you can never take it back. Major application from this piece here. Secondly, um, those formerly of a republic as opposed to a principality can only be overcome by being destroyed or occupied. Allowing them to maintain their way is not an option. So Machiavelli is saying, if you have a people who are used to being free, you must occupy their land, meaning overwhelm them with force of numbers. Put your soldiers there to force them to obey your new way. Because the truth is, no matter how much you try to teach them, they're not going to willingly adopt your ways. They must be forced. So you have to occupy with your soldiers or you have to have your soldiers there applying force and making them do what you want. So really... Those are the very best ways when you're dealing with formerly free people. As you can tell, Machiavelli is pointing out that ideally you want to plant your seed in fertile ground, which is to say, if you're going to establish a principality somewhere or you're going to conquer a land, conquer a land where the subjects are used to being subjects, not citizens. Because if you conquer a land where the individuals there are used to being citizens, meaning they're in a republic, they've had freedom, you're going to have more work to do because you're going to have to enforce a culture which will require a lot of effort and capital on your part. Page 40, Machiavelli writes, quote, A wise man ought always to follow the paths beaten by great men and to imitate those who have been supreme, end quote. This is a very obvious one, but sometimes we forget it. And I often, in my philosophy, tell you, go for the top, go for the best. And Machiavelli is saying the same thing in this quotation, which is to say that success leaves clues. Machiavelli being the type of strategist and pragmatist that he is, he would never tell you to follow a leader because they're good. He would tell you to follow a leader because they're effective. So he might say, hey, learn something from the path beaten by great men such as Mahatma Gandhi, but also learn from the path beaten by great men such as Adolf Hitler. And the reason for that is because clearly Adolf Hitler was good at something because he nearly took over the world. There are lessons there and you should study them. Carrying on, quote, The innovator has for enemies all of those who have done well under the old conditions and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. End quote, page 42. A critically important concept that Machiavelli forwards 
which shares that anytime you create innovation within an organization, within a structure, there are people who are going to experience change and the change that they experience will cause a loss in status. The people who lose status will inevitably become enemies of that leader who is creating the change. So you must always anticipate that, that situation. Secondly, and this is the disheartening part, you will have lukewarm defenders and those who may do well under the new circumstances, which is to say, when you make this change, the people who stand to benefit, they won't be gung-ho enthusiasts about your changes because they've yet to benefit. They've only heard the benefits described. They have yet to taste the fruit. They've only heard about the fruit. So they will only be lukewarm supporters, which is to say, anytime you bring overt innovation, you're going to have people who are disgruntled because they're losing status or position. And then the people who should support you won't be very enthusiastic. They'll be supportive because they still are uncertain of the measure of the true benefit. So you have to be steadfast and focused and really push through to make changes. And when you do so, you should always make sure that your changes do not seem to require a lot of work of people. They don't seem to be overt because human beings are weary of change because change requires adjustment, it requires effort, and generally speaking, the human nature is to be lazy and to do what is easy. So always be thoughtful about how you market what you're going to do. If you're going to do a change, you really want to make sure your messaging suggests that the change will benefit everyone, suggests that the change will require very little of people, will require them to do very little work, and, maintain, and they get to maintain a lot of the same things that they enjoy. So that's a hugely important thing for Machiavelli, and that will help you in managing your family as well as your professional affairs. And it's all about how you message what is going to happen. You have to be thoughtful about the words that you use when you are leading people. Um, moving on to chapter seven. In chapter seven, Machiavelli recounts a story of a duke who inherited a state that was overwhelmed with crime. This duke knew that the only way to turn this state around was to use a heavy hand because there was so much crime. So the duke brought in a minister whom he knew was a very harsh man. And this minister did what a harsh man would do to restore law and order in the land. And after being very heavy handed, he was able to restore law and order. And in great measure, the people were very happy, but they thought this new duke, geez, he's a really mean guy. And so they had a negative view of the duke. What the duke did is he says, you know what? I would like you all to know that any harshness that you have experienced is due entirely to the cruel nature of this minister who's been handling these affairs. And I assure you, I didn't know he was such a cruel man. And he has not only violated you and your rights as subjects, he has also violated my kindness. And to show you how I feel about what he has done, he shall be hanged. So this duke made a spectacle of hanging this particular minister. As a result, he was able to strategically distance himself from the harshness of this minister while still having instrumentalized this particular minister and used him as a pawn to establish law and order in this land. And there was only one way to do it and it had to be done with a heavy hand. So he had this guy do it and then once the job was done, he swept him away by murdering him, right? And so what this duke essentially did is he had an iron fist within a velvet glove. And so Machiavelli would tell you, if you can ever escape blame, you should always do so. As a prince, you should always seek to avoid being hated, for that is something that is very difficult to recover from and will create determined enemies. So the important thing to do is to make your moves covert, to leverage other people as the front man, and if everything goes bad, to distance yourself. Here is one of my favorite quotations from the book. It's on page 53, and it reads, quote, an effective prince knows the following is necessary to secure himself in his new principality, to win friends, 
to overcome either by force or fraud, to make himself beloved and feared by the people, to obey and be, excuse me, to be obeyed and revered by his soldiers, to exterminate those who have power or reason to hurt him, to change the old order of things for new, to be severe and gracious, magnanimous and liberal, to destroy a disloyal soldiery and create a new one, to maintain friendship with kings and princes in such a way that they help him with zeal and offend with caution. Let me give you the interpretation of that. There's so much richness here and there's so much duality. The prince is supposed to be able to inhabit seemingly contradictory characteristics and identities. So let me dig in with you. So basically Machiavelli is saying, if you want to secure your power, you must be able to win friends, which is critically important. He says, anytime you go into a new land, you need the support of the natives at some level because the less support you have, the more force you're going to have to exercise, the more capital. So you always want to make friends anywhere you want a power base. Secondly, he says to overcome by force or fraud. We generally think of fraud as a negative thing, right? It's trickery, it's cheating. He says, if you gotta do it, do it. Do whatever it takes by any means necessary. He is the original person to forward this strategy to make himself beloved and feared by the people. They should love you and fear you. It's almost like your father, right? It's like you love him, but you know if you do something crazy, he's going to give you that spanking, right? And it says to be obeyed and revered by your soldiers. Critically important to be obeyed. Soldiers obey. So you need that level of obedience. That's what you should be seeking from your killers, right? Because if your killers are not ones who revere you and obey you, they won't kill for you, they will kill you, which is a problem. So that's something that you really need to be thoughtful about. There have been many leaders who have been overthrown by a military coup, it's very common. And that's why in this same quotation, he says to destroy a disloyal soldiery and create a new one. If you look at Francois Duvalier in Haiti, when he was ruling that land, he created the Tantan Mecu and basically created his own private army because the existing army at a certain level had been trained by the Americans. So you didn't really know where their loyalty was. So he created almost his own militia and he was the only Haitian president in the hundred years that had preceded him who finished out a term and died of natural causes, right? So this is real knowledge that works in the real world, folks. Also, it reads to, to exterminate those who have power or reason to hurt him. Which is to say, if people have power within your principality, that's not good. You want to cripple all of those folks. Now, if you think about it right now, the president of the United States is actually gaining power because the other people who have power in America, which is a plutocracy, meaning a country run by the rich, the people who are running major multinational corporations, they're losing money. So they're actually reducing in power, which means that those who hold political power are maybe becoming stronger than they've ever been. And they're getting to influence private industry, which is only going to strengthen the, the position as a government leader, right? So this is these are very interesting times. Further, it says to change the old order of things for new, which makes sense, right? You're a new prince. You need things to be according to your culture, according to your way of operating. Then it says to be severe and gracious. And remember what he said about severity and being gracious. If you're going to be liberal, you should give that out in drops. So people feel like it's constant, it's regular, and they're appreciating it. If, it's, if you're going to be severe, you must give it out all at once, right? So that it's harsh, it's effective, but people can forget about it because it was in one big tranche, right? To be magnanimous and liberal, and to maintain friendships with kings and princes in such a way that they want to help with zeal and offend with caution. The important thing is he said maintain friendships with princes and kings, meaning those who also have power, those who can be of help to you. Really be thoughtful about whom you invest time in. Your relationships should be with people who will be fruitful to your advancement, right? You can't be friends with everyone because you don't have time. Really be targeted in who you're investing your time in. He not only said that they will help with zeal, but they will offend with caution, meaning that even though they're friends, they know you're a cold-blooded killer, so they're going to be very thoughtful before they think about doing you wrong. And that's really what you need to be clear about who you are, that, hey, I'm a magnanimous man, I'm a good man, I'm a great man, 
but I am also a cold-blooded killer if it calls for it.